is I guess some of us you know, in sin and didn't know that God cared for us, and yet God cared all the time. He was concerned. And then God was willing to give His only begotten Son for hell deserving sinners, not just to some good person or the righteous. They don't need that, brother. He gave it to hell deserving sinners like you and like me. We should be in hell. We deserve hell. We deserve no better. But God didn't let that happen. God had every. Everything fixed to where Sammy Kay or you or anybody could be saved by grace. Jesus was willing to give his own life. He said, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down. And I lay it down, but I take it again. And he did. On the resurrection morning, he arose just like he said he would. So the Holy Spirit was willing to indwell people like you and me. And tonight, every born-again child of God in this house of God, and I hope it's everybody, but in case it's not, you can be saved before you leave this church tonight. But I know that, and, and the Bible teaches that every child of God has the Holy Spirit now. You do not have to seek for Him, scratch for Him, work for Him, anything. When you got saved by the grace of God, He came in. He's the one that changed you. So we have the Holy Spirit willing uh, to indwell us. We have the Word of God that's willing to enlighten us and to show us our way. What would we do without the Bible? What would you do without this good old copy of the King James Bible? I tell you, I'd rather have this than anything I own. Materialistically speaking, I speak truth before God. I'd rather have this Bible and be able to sit down and read it than to have anything else I've got in this world. I'll take it all, but leave me the Word. I'll take the Word over all of it because this is what makes me happy. I've even talked to the Lord about that. Lord, you know, I thank you for this blessing, and I thank you for this blessing. And many times, I mean, I have to thank him for the blessings, but I always add, Father, uh, you know that I'm, I appreciate I appreciate all these things, but they're not what makes, they're not, they're not what makes me happy. What's, what makes me happy is you. You make me happy for saving my soul and living with me and in me and leading and guiding me and blessing me and letting me sense the dear Holy Spirit bearing witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. So we have the Spirit of God, we have the Word of God, we have the Father, we have the Son, and then of course we have the work of God, willing to uh, patiently work with us. And God has made it to where we can work. And I like to work. I enjoy working. And brother, listen, let me tell you something. He said, work now, for the night cometh when no man can work. So we ought to be working for God right now. He can save, He can seal, He can supply, He can take care of our every need. So the promise of God is a valid promise. Every promise of God is yea. So we have several important features concerning God's promises, and I want to name just a few of them here tonight very quickly. First of all, we have the promise of God of, a, of companionship. In John 14, 16, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter, that He may abide with you forever. My friend, abide means to inhabit, to remain, to continue, to continue with, to never leave. We're talking about Jesus. He said, if you abide in me, and I abide in you, you'll bear fruit. And so, my friend, we have a person now that abides with us forever. And a person may visit some of us, and stay a while and then leave. I remember when I was little, and Mama, Grandma Bell, my mama's mother, when she would come to stay sometime for two weeks or whatever, and she would uh, wash the dishes, help clean the clothes, help do all the work, bring in firewood and all that. And boy, it was a happy time when Grandmama came to our house and stayed a while. But then in a little while she'd say, well, I've got to go home now. And I'd say, no, you don't have to go home. Yeah, I've got to go now. I've got other things to do. And she would leave, and my heart was always sad because Grandma was not there anymore. Well, you know what? It's sad to have good friends like that or loved ones like that, and they depart from you sometime. And we've got people in our church right now are going through grief because of a, of a loved one leaving this world recently. We've had several funerals. We've got another this coming uh, next week. 
And so I don't know if I announced that tonight or not. I can't remember, but Loretta Fowler, uh, her graveside is Tuesday at 3 o'clock at Woodlawn. And so I meant to announce that. If I didn't, I'll do it again. So Jesus said that this companion would abide with us how long? Forever. He didn't say, the Holy Spirit never said to you and me, now I'm going to stay a couple of weeks, but then I've got to go. I'm going to stay a couple of years, and then I've got to go. I've got to go back home. He is not ever going to say that. He's never going to tell you and me that I'm leaving you. He's going to be with us forever and forever and forever. And brother, I'll never say goodbye. So I'll never have to worry about that. I'll never have to worry about the Holy Spirit leaving me or forsaking me. You will never have to worry about anything like that. And so he'll never depart. Over in Luke chapter 19 and verse 5, and when, when, when Jesus uh, came to the place, and this is speaking of Zacchaeus, the little man that climbed the sycamore tree to, see, to, tree to see Jesus, and when he got up there, Jesus passed by. The Bible says he came to that place, and he said to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Now, Jesus made a bodily visit to Zacchaeus' house. He made a visit there, and he left him old-time Holy Ghost salvation. Zacchaeus was converted. He got really saved by the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus bodily had to leave Zacchaeus, but, praise God, the Holy Spirit never has to leave us. That's why Jesus promised that he would give us another comforter. So the abiding companion that we have now, and, uh, and of course we know that Zacchaeus was so uh, taken with Jesus and so converted and convinced that he said to Jesus, after Jesus uh, came to him and did what he did for him in Luke chapter 19, verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if any if I've taken anything by any man, from any man, by false accusation, I'll pay him back fourfold. I wonder how many Christians would do that today. I don't think there'd be one anywhere in the world that would do anything like that today. I don't know of anybody, no matter how good they are, would give that kind of money and means to somebody else. It just will not work that way now. We, don't, we might give a little here and a little there, help a little here and help a little there, but we hold on to the bulk of it. We hold on to the big amount of it because we love that money. We love what we've got. We love our bank account. You say, Brother Sammy, you're getting so hateful, I just don't want to hear you preach anymore. That is hateful, isn't it? But some of us love our things better than we love him, and we wouldn't obey him no matter what. And so listen, my friend, the companion that we have is an important feature in the promises of God. God promised us a companionship, and we've got it. We've got it tonight. Then not only did he promise a companionship, but a comfort. In John 16, 7, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. It is expedient. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, comfort means consolation, ease, pleasure, prosperity, reassurance, on and on. We're talking about something so wonderful that if you grab hold of that, it'll keep you going when the going gets rough. It'll keep you going up, going on for God whenever the devil is on your case and trying to get you to stop serving the Lord. In Psalm 119, verse 50, and you know the Word of God is so important. This is my comfort, the psalmist said, in my affliction. For thy word hath quickened me. He knew what was the power that changed his life. I knew what the power is that changed my life. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So you and I have got the word of God, and brother, don't ever, don't ever do away with it. Don't ever let it sit on a shelf and just collect dust. Pick it up, open it up, read it, and get blessed by it. People were afraid and uncomfortable back when Saul of Tarsus was running loose before he got saved. He was a Pharisee, very religious, but he was mean. He was mean. He persecuted the church. He hated Jesus. He hated the name of Jesus. 
and he had people killed and thrown in jail and all the rest of that mean stuff. But on the road to Damascus, the Lord brought him down and he got saved in the grace of God. And then he started preaching for the Lord Jesus Christ. And until he is dying day, he preached the word of God. He started churches. He encouraged people. He wrote these letters under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and gave them advice and gave them instructions and told them how to live for God. He rebuked evil. He, he wouldn't stand for false doctrine. He would correct it in his churches and let them know, don't let anybody be, be, bewitch you. Don't let anybody deceive you. You stand for what I preach. You, you just believe what I told you, and don't you change from that. He said, if anybody come unto you preaching any other gospel, even an angel from heaven, he said, don't bid him into your house. He said, don't even, don't, and John said that, don't invite him into your house. So, brother, the Bible is one true piece of material. You and I have this one old book here that's lasted down through the years. Uh, they said uh, this past week I heard uh, that this Bible is still the bestseller in, in the world. More people are buying the Bible. Did you see, and I don't know how uh, good this is, I haven't been able to investigate it, but up in Kentucky those young people are having a revival. I think they had something like 200,000, and they were talking about God and Jesus, and, they're ta and I heard one testify, sounded just as straight as she could be. So I guess it's right, but wouldn't it be good if all our young people got together in thousands and thousands and, and strong and just talked about Jesus and praised his name? Uh, brother, that's what America would need. That'd help us have a revival. So listen, praise God, if there, anything ever even touches near here, I want to jump in on it unless it's a compromising thing. I'm not talking about the ecumenical movement now. I'm not talking about joining up with the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and the Hell Raisers and all these others. I'm not talking about joining up like that. But if somebody will live for Jesus, son, I'll get in with them. I'll back them. I'll do whatever I can. But in Acts 9, 31, after Paul got saved, listen to what it said. Then had the churches rest. Boy, when that old mean guy got saved, the churches could relax. He probably won't come by here anymore. He'll never be by our church and try to hurt us, take us to jail or kill us because he's saved now. And so the Bible says the churches had rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. They were built up. They weren't torn down now. They weren't scattered and they weren't persecuted by him or his cohorts. But now, brother, they're built up in the faith. They're encouraged in the Lord. They're having a great time. And then the Bible says, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Brother, when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of a church and they are comfortable, knowing that he's the one doing the comforting, brother, the church is going to be blessed. And the church will grow. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. Some of us are going through tribulations right now. Some of us are having troubles. Some in the home. Some outside the home. But we're having troubles. Some of our members are having some troubles here and there. But listen, he's the God of all comfort. Boy, we've sung about him tonight. Boy, he'll never let you go. He'll answer prayer. He'll bless your heart. He'll stir you up. He'll get you on fire for God. So don't you ever give up. Don't ever give up. Don't let the devil talk you into some silly thing. You stay right in there with the Lord. So God promises us a companionship. We got it. He promised, it, uh, promised us a comfort, and we got that. And then he promised a concern back there in John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now our text, uh, and of course we know that our lost condition uh, greatly concerned the Lord Jesus Christ. He had a concern for us, like I said, before we ever knew anything about him. Praise his holy name. He was the only one that could save our soul. Michael the archangel could not. Gabriel could not. Not a seraphim or a cherubim, not an angel of any kind 
could save our soul. There was not a man anywhere that would ever be born that could be our Savior. It had to be Jesus. He was the only one in all the great universe for time and eternity that could save a soul like you and me. But he did. He did. He paid for our salvation. We owed a debt we could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. And brother, we ought to thank him tonight in our heart for paying that debt for me because I knew what I was and I knew I was going down the wrong road for a long time. But brother, let me tell you something now. I'll stand here till the day I take my last breath and say, Jesus, <laughs> he saved my soul. He saved my soul. And I'm, I'm here to tell it until my toes turn up. I'd rather have Jesus than anything I know. I'd rather have Jesus. He takes everything I own. I'm telling the God truth. Put me out in the woods with a little old tent and my Bible, and I'm going to shout the victory. I'll guarantee you I would. You said, Brother Sammy, you wouldn't really do that. You, I would, I would, I would. Because everything I get and add to what I got, it doesn't make me one ounce happier. I appreciate it. I appreciate every blessing. Now, don't get me wrong. I appreciate every day that God has given me to live. I'm 83 years old this month. Hey, and I appreciate every day he's given me. But let me tell you something. I appreciate something more than that. I appreciate health more than life. If I can't be healthy and preach the word and get up here every morning and pray and study and get a hold of God and he get a hold, <laughs> get a hold of me, I don't want to live here. I want to go on to glory and be with him. Boy, I tell you, I appreciate everything God's done, but I love him better than all. In Luke 19, 10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And John 10, 10, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, his promises are worth waiting for. So we have just these three. I can name many others. But he promised us companionship, comfort, and concern. He's concerned. I promise you I was concerned for you. Jesus would say to us tonight, I promise you, I had a love for you before you ever loved me. And the Bible teaches that. We love him because he first loved us. So we have the promise here, and then we have the people, the people for whom he promised these things to. In John 7, 38, the Bible says, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. He didn't say that they which do the best they can or do good works or get baptized or go to church or do this. All those things are good things to do, but that's not how you got in. He, that's not how you get the Holy Ghost either. Not for them that seek and seek and seek. He didn't say that. He didn't say you got to seek and seek and seek for the Holy Ghost and then get him. He said those that believe, they can get the Holy Spirit. Now, there are other scriptures that bear this out. The day you and I got saved, whether you, saw, you didn't see him, but whether you believed it or not or experienced it or not or knew about it is, uh, pretty well, you probably were ignorant like I was. I didn't know what took place the night I got saved. I knew I got saved. But I didn't know what the, all the things that happened. I knew I believed the Word of God. I knew I believed what that preacher pointed out in the Bible that I had to do to be saved. And I accepted Jesus the best I knew how. And it changed my life. And it gave me joy unspeakable and full of glory. I know all that. But I learned later that the Holy Spirit was the one that came in the very second I got saved. Hallelujah. I tell you, and I believe you ought to read your Bible because you learn a lot. We was talking a while ago, Sister Hazel got a new Bible, and she told me a while ago, before she got in the choir, she appreciated her new Bible. Said she was reading it, and you know, she, of course, she was talking about having to learn some things. I said, well, it's slow sometimes, but just stay with it. Just stay in there and keep on because everything's going to be all right. Brother Ponder, I don't know if he's here tonight or not, but I gave him a Schofield Bible back some time ago, a couple of months ago. And that brother Ponder, he was such a blessing. He appreciated that Schofield Bible more than a child does a bicycle. I mean, he appreciated that Bible so much, he kept saying, thank you, preacher. Thank you, preacher. Now, he brings his Schofield Bible, and that's a King James. 
Now he can look at the page number, and he's reading his Bible and learning, and he's up in years. I don't know how old Brother Ponder is, but he's made become a friend of mine. I'm telling you, I love the man. I appreciate him. And I don't think he's here tonight, but if he's here tonight, he'd understand what I'm saying. And I'm bragging on him. I'm not putting him down. I'm saying I praise God for this man. He blesses my heart. So the people whom uh, these promises are given to are believers, believers. In 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that believe, that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Believe and know. Believe and know. How do you know you're going to heaven, Brother Sammy? I believe. I believe Jesus. I believe His Word. Well, you don't feel that good all the time. No, I don't. I don't feel good. I don't even feel like a Christian sometimes. But that don't have a thing to do with my belief. I believe Jesus all the way. I believe Him when I'm up. I believe Him when I'm down. I believe Him when I'm assured. And when I've got everything going, I feel like the Holy Ghost is just going to take me out of here. And I feel him when I'm low down and dragging. And I just can't get any steam, so to speak. But I still believe. I believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sammy K. right now is nothing. But he's everything. And I do believe his precious gospel. So it's to those that believe. Belief is faith, trust, dependence and expectancy. Praise God, our faith, and without faith it's impossible to please Him. We walk by faith, we trust in Him with all of our heart, and then we depend on Him for everything. I depend on Him for uh, salvation and sustenance and everything that God gives me. I'm waiting for it. I'm looking for it. I'm expecting it. I'm expecting it to be able to buy groceries the best I can till I get home to glory. And then not only the believers, but patient. In Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus said, And behold, I send a promise of my Father upon you, but tarry, or wait ye, in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now this, of course, had to be a patient waiting. They heard what he said, his instructions, so they did that. He was here uh, with them, talking to them, telling them what to do, and now they've got to obey him. Now, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For we know, for you know, and you have need of patience. You have need of patience. Now, this is not to get saved. This is to live right, <coughs> to live for Him, to obey Him. That after you have done the will of God, and the will of God is what? Jesus said to believe on Him, that him whom He has sent. So that's the will of God that you get saved. The will of God that you believe. And that you might receive the promise. Being uh, uh, patient and waiting on His Word, you'll receive promises from Him. So the promises of God are worth waiting for. When you say, these are for believers, these are for those that are patient, and then for those that are thirsty. In Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Psalm 42, 1, the psalmist said, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my heart after thee, O God. Hey, I know what that feels like. I know exactly what he's talking about. Because my heart, I found myself panting, as it were, after God, the things of God. You know, I've told you many times or several times back when I was a kid in the cotton field picking cotton. My mom had read the Bible story to us that night or whatever, and told us about God, and I heard about God, and I was very impressed with Mama's talk about God. I wasn't saved. I just was impressed with the fact of God. And then when I'd be picking cotton, sometime I'd stop picking, and I'd start getting the goose ticks out of it. You know what that is. I'd stand there and daydream. Then I'd look up that blue sky, and I said, Mama said God's up there. Boy, I wished I could go there. I wished I could know God. I remember when I was a kid, little old eight, nine, ten years old, I said, I'd love to know God. Boy, little did I know, God was listening. He saw my heart yearning, yearning for him, yearning for him. And I was up a grown man, living in sin, raising hell, and doing everything the devil wanted me to do. And then one night, one night, 
God swooped down, picked me up, saved my soul, and said, here I am, son. And brother, I had known about him, but I didn't know him. But after that night, I knew him. And I've been knowing him ever since. And I'm going to tell you, I'm living by faith. I've never seen him with a natural eye. I'm not coming to you with some put on religious experience. You know, I saw God walking. He was nine, and uh, what did Royal Roberts say? 90 feet high. He said, I talked face to face with him. Royal Roberts was six foot tall, and Jesus, 90 foot tall. How did he talk face to face with him? He must have had Jacob's ladder. Yeah. Huh? But see, they talk all that foolishness. I saw him in the middle of the night. He walked with me, took me by the hand. I've had every kind of testimony you can name. And I was preaching against the dreams out of Jeremiah. God said, if they dream, let them dream. Let them tell the dream. Don't let them tell you I told them. I didn't tell them. And I got to preaching against these fake dreams. And one woman came to me and said, Brother, I wouldn't have a testimony if I didn't have my dream. And I said, Well, ma'am, if that's all I had to lean on, I believe I'd go to the Bible and start searching. I don't believe I'd depend on some little dream I had uh, at night. Now, God speaks to us, but now he speaks to us today through the Word and by his Spirit. Now, if you didn't do it that way, you might as well forget it. You're getting the wrong signal, friend. You better go to the Word of God. So then we have these promises. We have the people that believe, that are patient, that are thirsty, and lastly, we have the power. Tarry until what? You be endued with power from on high. Did you know God gave them power and he has given you and me the same opportunity, the same power, the power to work? Philippians 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. We couldn't do God's will without the Spirit. And then he gave us power not only to work but to walk. Over there in Ezekiel 36, 27, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. God can cause us to walk right. And then the last little thing right here, he causes us and gives us power to wait, to work and to walk and to wait. Wait on him. Don't get frustrated. Don't become impatient. Go to church regular. Now, some of you, you know, kindly lay out. And I love you, I love you, but the Bible says, and here's why I do it. The Paul told Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Rebuke, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, every once in a while, there has to come a little rebuke. But that's not because I hate anybody. That's not because I'm mad at anybody. God told me to rebuke. If there's something not going just right, I'm going to tell you it's not right. I'm not going to beat around the bush, and I'm not going to be arrogant, and I'm not going to be a smart aleck, but I'm going to tell you what it says. Or I'm going to die one. I'm not going to live and hide stuff and let it be built up, and I didn't tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you exactly when you're doing wrong. And praise God, you ought to take it like a man, like a woman of God, if you're really right. You say, now you look like you're getting mad. Well, that's what everybody says I look like. Would this, be, would this help? I don't know what to help. I said, I can't help the way God made me. Some woman said to me one time, I can't stand to look at your eyes. I said, well, that's all I got. That's the ones God gave me. Yes, sir. Now, it's worthwhile waiting for God's promises. I promise you. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, and to wait for his son from heaven. Oh, I wish you'd come, Jesus. Why don't you come right now? That's my desire, is he would come right now. But if he doesn't, I've got to patiently wait. Wait for his coming, because he'll be here right on time. Wait for his son, Jesus, to deliver us from the wrath to come. And so he's uh, Jesus, the one that re delivered us from the wrath to come. Wrath is coming to the world, but we've been delivered by the grace of God. Promises, many of them. I, I couldn't name them all. But listen, it's worth waiting for. It's worth looking for to God for. So if you are, are kind of in a drag or low down or you feel low down and feel bad and you just not got the energy you ought to have just wait on God trust him read your Bible pray talk to him he'll he'll snap you out he'll revive you he'll revive you I promise you he will he'll give you a blessing that's what God's good for let's stand our feet if there's anyone here tonight
If you're not saved, then you're welcome to come to this altar, and uh, we'll show you how to be saved. We'd love to do that. We have somebody to come every now and then. Matter of fact, even after the benediction, we have people to come sometimes and say, I, I want to get saved. I've had people, when I pray that sinner's prayer, I've had a number of people over the years to say, I got saved while uh, you were praying that sinner's prayer. And I'd say, God can save you anywhere, anytime. So all you've got to do is believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what Paul told that Philippian jailer. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you, Father, for salvation, plumb and plain. Thank you for the Holy Ghost that has made it real to our heart and our lives. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ who shed his blood that we might be redeemed, set free, and on our way to heaven. Now bless our church, our Father, I pray. I pray that this church will always be the 